Hey everybody, welcome back. I wanted to make a follow-up video to my previous videos about my ongoing struggle with the University of California, Berkeley. And at this point, it has reached national attention. It's reached the attention of the FBI. It's reached the attention of two separate police departments. It's reached the attention of the Department of Education and my attorney. So this is a very big deal and it's a very big scandal at the school. I've been talking with reporters about this and organizations on and off campus so this is a very big deal and the topic is somewhat grave uh the scandal is very troubling and i know that in my previous videos i wanted to be kind of flippant in uh conveying the information to everybody just to keep the content engaging so that's partly why i was doing that um but you know i think that this is such a serious topic that it may be kind of hard to do that so please like and subscribe so that I can continue to be bringing this troubling content to your attention. So the topic of this video is that complaining students are being illegally incarcerated and drugged during the pandemic. And when I say being drugged, I don't mean that, you know, they're giving people Regeneron, they're giving people like a vaccine for the coronavirus. When I say being drugged, I mean that the students are being injected forced to take high-dose neuroleptic uh, pills or medications or psychotropics um, that are designed to reduce critical thinking skills. And actually, when they first came out with these drugs, they marketed them as the chemical lobotomy. So this is very serious. And this is actually what happened to me. And it's well documented. And uh, I will present that to you during the video. So... Um, <clears throat> Students, uh, I want to preface this by saying what happened to me at UC Berkeley, first of all, is I was admitted to their EECS program and I had a very good GPA. I had like a 4.66 and uh, there at that time was bomb threats and gun violence on campus. Uh, the campus was melting down. I witnessed somebody get robbed at gunpoint. Um, things were just spiraling out of control. Uh, staff members completely inaccessible and that's documented as well uh, so I left and I left in good academic standing uh, with proper medical papers as well and they're telling me that I cannot be readmitted to the school because they consider that to be a personal problem a failure to cope a lack of technical competency and then they just arbitrarily denied my ability to appeal the decision um, they just stripped me of everything. Um, so we have students coming from other countries, coming from out of state, without a support structure, and their living situation depends on their admission to the college. <clears throat> Not everybody has the advantage of just being able to go live with mom and dad, especially now. I mean, okay, so about half of millennials and Gen Z are being forced economically to depend on their parents. Uh, because they have 2% of the wealth and income in the country. So that's very troubling. But what's more troubling is that when a student, their living situation depends on the school and the school can just arbitrarily ice them out. Uh, that puts a lot of power in the hands of the university to just blackmail people. And that's what they did to me. And <clears throat> you may, you may say, okay, well, can't you transfer to another four year school? No, because in California, <clears throat> They have what's called IGETSI requirements. And IGETSI requirements stigmatize transfer students. Uh, so transfer students are actually considered unqualified to transfer to another four-year school, whereas students out of high school are, uh, which makes no sense, right? You would think that a student who is a transfer student has more experience, uh, more competency, but actually the way that IGETSI works is that actually you're not. You're screwed you have to go to commuter school. If you transfer out, you have to go to commuter school. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with commuter school except that students study very hard so that they can make use during their undergraduate of a world-class university. And some people, like me, they have conservative fundamentalist parents that they would have to live with. Or their parents have disowned them, like my parents. So really, that's not a solution, is it? Then there's the idea of, oh, get a job. Oh, okay, so, but the problem here is that the dead-end, low-wage, indiscriminate, unstable, unspecialized labor isn't adequate to facilitate a reasonable quality of life independently 
while simultaneously continuing one's education. So uh, this isn't the 1950s anymore, I'm sorry to say, but it doesn't work. So those two options are not on the table. And I'm telling you that as somebody who worked at Starbucks, who worked at Kohl's, uh, who worked at PetSmart, who worked at graveyard shifts, and even worked in construction, where I was driving three miles back and forth uncompensated to the middle of the desert, hazed by people, uh, wiring solar panels, and living on only a hope and a prayer of any sort of career advancement. So that really wasn't adequate. Alienated from quality peers in my life stage, it just was not cutting it. So that idea is off the table. So uh, if you cannot be readmitted and you're stripped of everything and the administrative faculty refuse valid medical paperwork, you know, uh, they deny the ability to appeal the decision. Um, you know, it's also kind of odd that they're saying that I'm technically incompetent when I call the school and I wait a full hour on hold and the message that I get on their end is that they're experiencing technical difficulties. Uh, so then they threaten the students with a $100,000 fine in jail time if they complain by California Penal Code 653M, which is harassment. Uh, so they feel harassed by students asking them to be doing their own job. And that's really what's happening. <clears throat> so let me get into the drugging part, okay? So in California, there's something called the 5150, which gives the police the ability to just arbitrarily consider that a person's socioeconomic instability is a mental or behavioral problem on the part of the individual. And the reason for this is so that they can isolate the individual from the socioeconomic context that they're in. So they can gaslight people. And that's what they're doing here because they're saying, well, this is a mental problem on your part that the administrative faculty have left you in this situation as people in roles of authority that are responsible to their students. So, you know, I guess that's a mental problem. To, I don't understand it, but I think we understand why that's happening. So the 5150, what they do is... Uh, and really, it's also a, a rationalization for disposing of people. It's an extension of law enforcement. It's a way to damage control, uh, act as a thought police. Um, it, it's kind of a way of saying that the brain and needs of the students are a disease to be cured. It's a, uh, the failure of the people in roles of authority aren't the issue. It's the students' awareness of it. It's the situation that the students have been left in uh, that has become the rationalization to treat it as though uh, you are a disease to be cured, or that you have a disease, or that your brain is diseased, and your capacity for awareness and critical thinking, as well as your very existence as a disenfranchised person is like a crime or, or a disorder of some kind. And it is, it's a disorder to them, because it challenges the conventional narratives that they have. So uh, the diagnosis can be used against a person to rationalize disposing of them and undermine their credibility. Uh, and actually that's the function of it. But that, when the, that means they have to be ADA ex accessible in communications and that they cannot discriminate based on the manifestations of the disability or previous disability. The paperwork is just uh, conveniently refused and then they're told it's a personal problem. So they're trying to have it both ways. Uh, so when a student complains to the staff or administrative faculty, uh, the staff or administrative faculty feel threatened and harassed, and that warrants police intervention. But when a student win witnesses gun violence and bomb threats, uh, or has an emergency or contracts COVID, maybe they were sexually assaulted, that's just a personal problem and a failure to cope and technical incompetence of the students. Uh, and that is problematic when students are paying record tuition for a radically inaccessible staff. Uh, so the police, what they did to me, they drove me to the hospital. Nobody was believing my story. You know, uh, I was given process for the highest level of security clearance in the country. I worked at a research and development subsidiary of Boeing as a full-time engineer without my engineering degree. Uh, I have lots of projects and all sorts of uh, letters of recommendation and things like that. But of course, what? They don't, they don't believe my story, right? So in the hospital, they just strap me down and then they cart me away to a psychiatric unit. 
So, uh, <laughs> this was at this point in the middle of the night. They have you sitting in the hospital for like a full day. Like just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then they just ship you off to a psychiatric unit, right? 